Hi. Recently, I did a presentation on my top five tips for wilderness survival. So today will be my top five firearms for wilderness survival. And of course, it comes with a caveat that nothing I say today should be inferred as a tutorial or a recommendation. Even if I say you should do this or you should remember that, I am in no way trying to tell you what you should do. I'm only going to demonstrate the firearms that I would use for such a purpose. Now, when I talked about my top five tips for wilderness survival, some people described that as 30 minutes of introduction and 10 minutes of information. Today's presentation will also require some introduction, but I promise that the introduction will not be the predominant portion of the presentation. However, if you want to skip the introduction, by all means, fast forward to the part where you see me standing next to a sign that reads top five. Okay. For those who are still here, we have to briefly recap my definition of wilderness survival and briefly recap the top five tips. And remember, we've discussed these at length on a previous presentation, so today will be a brief recap. My definition of wilderness survival is five points. In the field, under adverse conditions, when you have to spend the night or multiple nights when you had not intended to and you were not prepared to. Now, to break that down, in the field means not being in a campground, but being in a wilderness area or the national forest. You're in the field. Under adverse conditions, that could be extremes of cold or extremes of heat, extremes of wet or extremes of dry. If I were in this particular spot in the middle of July, about the coldest the temperature would ever get at night would be about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And everything would be dry enough that getting a campfire going would be easy. There's also a freshwater spring in the area. That's not adverse conditions. But if I were in this same spot in the middle of January, the temperature could get down to about 20 degrees at night and there may be six inches of snow. That's adverse conditions. Now when I say spend the night or multiple nights, if I were up here in the middle of the day and someone I was with were to have a myocardial infarction and we had to alert EMS and evacuate that person, that's not a survival situation, that's a medical emergency. It doesn't turn into a survival situation until you have to spend the night. There would of course be some exceptions. Four is spending the night when you had not intended to. If it were my intent to spend the night here tonight, I would have a backpack with a tent and a sleeping bag and a camp stove and fuel and food and extra clothing. That's not a survival situation, it's a camping trip. Spending the night when you hadn't intended to. And five, when you were not prepared to. Now obviously in an environment like this, I'm gonna have my space blanket and fire starters and so forth, and you could argue that that's preparedness, but it's not truly being prepared to spend the night. I'm gonna give the example of a colleague and I went on a hiking trip and our, our intent to return on the afternoon of the third day. But looking at the map recon, I thought, if things go slower than what I expect, we might be out there an extra day. So I told people, we'll be back Thursday afternoon, but maybe Friday afternoon. Sure enough, things were slower than what I expected. And so we ended up inadvertently spending an extra night. So we're spending a night in the field when we had not intended to, but we still had tent, sleeping bags, stove, fuel, so on and so forth. We were absolutely prepared to do so. And that could be a subjective standard, but that's the way I'm going to define it. Now, my top five tips for wilderness survival. One, through proper prior planning, keep yourself out of the situation in the first place. Two, know yourself and seek self-improvement. Three, pack in accordance with your knowledge and skill level. But four, don't overpack. And five, keep all your gear together in one easily carryable thing so it's all together in there when you need it. So with that, without further ado, let's get to my top five. When people go into the field, they are quite often picking berries or going fishing or on a hiking trip or a camping trip. And although there are some exceptions, those types of activities are often done in the spring and summer months. But when people go into the field to hunt deer or elk or other game, those activities are often done in the fall or winter months, and that's when you're more likely to run into adverse weather conditions. And so, on my list of survival firearms, number one is the rifle that a hunter is typically going to have. In this case, a Marlin Model 1895CB in caliber 4570. Now, this rifle is rugged, it's accurate, it's powerful enough to deal with any game in my neighborhood, but firearms like this in terms of survival guns have two problems. One, 
it's very common when people are hunting deer that they'll take a rifle like this, load it to capacity, in this case 9 plus 1, and then they don't carry any extra ammunition. How many deer could you shoot? And so for a survival situation, that might leave you a little bit short. Also, when I go deer hunting, it's common that I don't even see a deer, but I will see a lot of squirrels, rabbits, upland game birds, things like that, which in my opinion are far more likely to be something that I'm going to shoot in a survival situation. And for those, a 4570 might be contraindicated. Let me show you what I mean. So here's our favorite target, a soda jug, and it's going to represent an upland game bird or a squirrel sitting on this log, and I'll shoot it from 25 yards with the 4570. Yes, that has happened to me in the field where I've shot a small animal with a big gun and after firing I had to ask the question, did it get away or did I just disintegrate it? Probably not going to be a lot left to eat here. Let's try something else. Now I've got a new animal set up and I'll shoot it from 25 yards with my Ruger 1022. Good hit, getting some arterial spray. Definitely going to incapacitate the animal, but there's plenty left to eat. So we can see the downside of using our big rifle for small game. So when I'm in the field hunting with a large caliber rifle, I'll often back it up with a small caliber pistol. Two of my favorites are my Beretta M922 and my Ruger Mark III. Both are caliber 22 long rifles, so they're the appropriate power to shoot something like our rabbit target. But it brings up the concern, can I achieve the appropriate accuracy to make them truly useful? We'll put that to the test. I'll go back 20 yards and I'll shoot the target on your left with the Mark III and the target on your right with the M922. Let's see how I do. So with the Mark III, we have eight hits and two misses. With our M9, we technically have 10 hits, but I'm not going to count that, so I'll call it nine hits. So our accuracy is okay. So it would seem that if you're hunting with a large caliber rifle, backing it up with a small caliber handgun could be a good idea. But there's two things I want to add to that. One, sometimes when people are hunting deer, they're not hunting with a rifle. They're hunting with a shotgun loaded with buckshot or slugs. Now, if you're using a specific slug gun that has a rifled barrel, that has different concerns, but using a smoothbore shotgun, then instead of backing it up with a small caliber handgun, you might have as a backup just a pocket full of shot shells. Another concern is that often when I say the word survival, there are certain people who immediately think survival means small. And instead of carrying a full-size handgun in small caliber, they'll want to carry a small handgun like this Ruger LCP in caliber 22 long rifle. It has advantages in that it is light and it's compact and very easy to carry, but there's a disadvantage as well. I'll go back 20 yards and I'll shoot this rabbit target with the Ruger LCP 22 and let's see how I do.
So we see our shots are a little more spread out with the smaller pistol, but we have seven hits and I missed one, two, three times. With the M922, I got nine out of 10 hits. With the LCP22, I have seven out of 10 hits, and the hits I have are more spread out. So we see a loss in accuracy, but in my opinion, not a prohibitive loss. There's a concept a lot of people have that the smaller handguns are less accurate than the larger handguns, and there is some validity to that. But more often, it's more correct to say that most people can't shoot the small handguns as accurately as they can shoot the larger handguns. And we see that here. Seven out of 10 hits as opposed to nine, and the hits we have are more spread out. There's also another disadvantage to the small handgun. Its very short barrel is going to cause significant loss in velocity. So that most 22 long rifle hollow points when fired out of a barrel this short are going to be below expansion threshold. So hits like these two low ones we have here with the larger handguns could be decisive hits. With the LCP-22, probably not. So far we've talked about survival guns in their role as something you'd use to shoot small game, presuming that you'd eat it. Survival guns have many other roles and I want to discuss three of them. One, defending yourself against large game that may be trying to eat you. Two, defending yourself against criminals. And three, shooting signal shots. Now in the area in which I reside, danger from large animals is minimal. The danger from bears is about as close to zero as you can get without actually being zero. My personal danger from cougars decreases in direct proportion to my increasing gray hair, but the danger from criminals is very real, even in remote areas. And so I'm going to carry a survival gun that creates a balance between those three categories and the importance of each category. And two of my favorites are my Beretta 92FS in caliber 9x19 and Sig Sauer M17 in caliber 9x19. Now we have a presentation where we shoot these two side by side, so there's no need to rehash all of that here. But the criteria of the gun for this role is going to be moderate caliber, reliable and I can shoot it accurately, and good capacity. And both of these guns have that. And I frequently carry several extra magazines. Now we've talked about while hunting carrying a powerful rifle backed up by a small caliber handgun. Let's reverse that. A lot of times when I'm in the field just doing a hiking trip, I'll carry a moderate to more powerful handgun backed up by a small caliber rifle. And my favorite is the Ruger 1022 takedown. It's light, the ammunition's light, it's easy to operate, and because it's a takedown, it can come apart and go into a pack. So let's see how this does on a target. So I'll shoot this rabbit target from 25 yards with the Ruger 1022 takedown model. Let's see how I do. And we have 10 out of 10 hits. This is the Mossberg Model 510 410 bore shotgun. It's very small and very light. Also, 410 ammo isn't nearly as bulky as 12 gauge ammo. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you that this is not my favorite 410 shotgun. However, its weight and its size make it very convenient to carry. So how effective will this 410 shotgun be? Well, here's our rabbit target. Now, if you take into consideration the number of rabbits that I've shot and the number I've seen shot with shotguns loaded with birdshot, they would number into the hundreds. And because of that, I hold the standard of six pellets of birdshot to be an effective hit. Now, sometimes you may get one lucky pellet and one will be all it takes, but six is the standard that I'm going to hold. So I'll shoot this rabbit target from 25 yards, and I've got the Mossberg 510 loaded with Federal 410 bore 3 inch 11 16 ounce of number 7.5 lead bird shot. Let's see how many pellets I can hold on a rabbit target. Normally I have the camera down there by the target, but with the spread of the shotgun, I'm going to keep the camera back here with me. And I want to show you the recoil, or lack thereof, that this gun has. This gun also has kind of a stiff action. I've got the shot holes covered with the red pasties, and I've hit the rabbit with at least 14 pellets, so that's pretty good. 
Now we'll go back 25 yards and repeat this drill and see if we can get a consistent result. And now shot number two. Let's see how we did. Now I have the pellet impacts covered with the blue pasties. With our first shot, we had at least 14 impacts. With our second shot, at least 15. So that's consistent. So if we're getting this many impacts at 25 yards, I can say that our Mossberg 510 is going to easily be effective at 30 yards or more. But when we're talking about survival guns and we're talking about 410 bar, there's a firearm that a lot of people are going to want to discuss. Yes, that one. Let's take a look. So, why would you carry this bulky 410 shotgun when you could carry this revolver loaded with 410 shells? Well, I've got a new rabbit target set up and I have my Taurus Judge revolver loaded with the same Federal 410 3-inch 11 16th ounce of number 7.5 lead birdshot. Let's shoot this target from 25 yards with this and see how many pellets we put on paper. So let's see how we do with the Judge. Let's take a look at the target. And here we see one hit in the leg. There aren't even any other pellets on the paper. Let's try another shot. So let's try another shot. And let's take a look. Now we have our shot holes covered with the blue pasties and we see two hits. This one doesn't count. Now I've cut the distance to 15 yards. Let's see how we do from here. Normally I'd cut that out. Now I have fairly good grip strength. I can't pull the trigger because the revolver's jammed. Let's try again. Now let's take a look. Now we have the shots covered with the yellow pasties, and we still have two hits, although now we're seeing a few more impacts on the paper. Now let's try it from 10 yards. Now let's take a look. Now from 15 yards, we have our shot holes covered with the green pasties, and we see three hits. However, I have to make note that two of those were hits in the leg, and they were both just in the line. They were only hits technically. Now we're back at 15 yards and I have a new target set up. And there are people who say that if you're going to try to shoot a rabbit with a judge revolver, you shouldn't load it with birdshot, you should load it with 45 Colt ammunition. Okay, two problems with that. One, 45 Colts in short supply these days. And two, if you're going to load it with conventional ammo, how does it make the judge any different than your conventional handgun? Now let's take a look at the target. And here you see my five shots. So once again, the Taurus Judge remains useless. Now this brings me to the last type of firearm I want to talk about. Now earlier today, I said that when people say survival, often they think small. And when I was talking about my top five tips for wilderness survival, I mentioned that and I used the example of the Smith & Wesson Model 638. Because it's light and it's compact, people will carry a gun like this in the field and call it their survival gun, and quite often guns like this are contraindicated. But there is an exception. That's the exception of when you're in the field and you want to carry a gun, but you need for other people to be unaware of that gun. Let me tell you an anecdote. Long time ago, I was on a camping trip with several other people and we're camped by the lake. It's the National Forest, absolutely legal to have a firearm. And the woman I was dating at the time wanted to take a walk on the path around the lake. That's about two miles. Okay, great, let's do that. So I get my LBV and I'm ready to go and she was instantly angry with me. Why do you need to carry that stuff? I always carry this stuff in the field. And I mentioned something about it's my survival equipment and she said, quote, no, that's combat, close quote. Not quite sure what she meant, but I am quite sure she was very angry, ruined the whole trip. Sometimes you need to have a firearm with you, but you need for your girlfriend to not be aware of it. And 
Yes, some people would say that would be cause to break up with her, but you're not going to break up with her in the middle of a camping trip. You need to do that when you get home. And so there are times when you need a small gun. And sometimes you'll be relegated to guns like an LCP. Now this gun is light, it's reliable, and very easy to conceal and hide from everyone. But little guns like this in the field have their downside. Let's shoot them. The FBI spent decades telling us that the mean distance for a lethal confrontation was seven yards. These days people will say that it's really less than that. I'm of the opinion that accurate statistics on citizen-involved shootings are extremely difficult to get. However, if you're in a self-defense situation in the wilderness area, in the national forest, I'm of the opinion that there's a good chance the distance you shoot will be greater than the distance you'd have to shoot if you were defending yourself at the ATM. So I've got this half-size silhouette set up, and I'm going to shoot it from 15 yards with the Ruger LCP. Let's see how I do. Effective at that distance? Reasonably so. But let's put up a new silhouette and repeat that drill with my Smith & Wesson Model 638. So in comparing the 638 and the LCP for our purposes today, even though the LCP holds more rounds and being an autoloader can be reloaded faster than the revolver, my choice is the 638 because it's more powerful and I can shoot it a little better than I can shoot the LCP. Finally, we're to the last firearm on my list. If you're in the field, you want to have a survival gun, but you need to keep it hidden, there's no question number one on my list is the Sig Sauer Model 365 caliber 9x19. When I bought this one, it came with two 10-shot magazines, and Sig had 12-shot magazines readily available. That may have changed by now. If I were to offer one piece of advice, it would be, if you're going to get one of these, if possible, get the one with the manual safety. This is a striker-fired firearm, but the trigger pull is short enough and light enough. I would prefer to have a manual safety if I were going to carry this in my pocket. But I'll go back 15 yards, shoot our Dirty Bird reactionary target, and let's see how I do. And there you go. This firearm is light, compact, has good capacity, and it's reasonably accurate. That one that's low, that's just me, and yes, that's very annoying. So there's my top five list. If you have a different list, and I presume you do, please share it. So as always, don't try this at home on what you call a professional, and thanks for watching my top five guns for wilderness survival video. So we're finished with today's presentation, but there's some things I want to say supplementally. One of them is, a few minutes ago you heard me mention that one of the roles of your survival firearm was shooting signal shots. Well, there's a couple of things I want to say about that. First, it is almost universally recognized that when you're shooting signal shots, the sign for distress is three evenly spaced shots. When you shoot those, they have to be evenly spaced. If you fire one, two, three, people won't recognize that as a signal. You also can't shoot them too fast. If you fire one, two, three, by the time that sound echoes through the hills, a lot of people won't be able to tell that it was three shots. But if you fire too slowly, such as one, two, by the time you get to your third shot, people won't recognize it as a three shot string. It has to be fired at a relatively slow, even cadence, like one, two, three. The second thing I want to say is, if you really want to get somebody's attention when you're shooting signal shots, shoot them in the dark. 
Different jurisdictions have different regulations. In the jurisdiction in which I reside, there is no specific prohibition against shooting after dark. However, there is a prohibition, with some exceptions, about hunting at night. So if it's during deer season and you shoot your three signal shots at night, you are going to get a lot of attention. Now, the people who hear those three signal shots, they might not recognize that you're in trouble and come to your aid. They might just call 911 and sick the police on you. But either way, you're going to get some attention. Now, another thing I need to discuss is when I did the presentation on my top five tips for wilderness survival, I told a long, tedious anecdote, and I had to preface that with a few things that I know the audience needs to know to listen to that anecdote. I've found that when I tell that story to a live audience, I am very frequently interrupted by people giving me advice that comes from a position of total ignorance. And I used the example of someone telling me that I should have used the GPS feature on my phone without understanding that it happened long enough ago that cellular phones didn't have GPS features. Another piece of coulda, woulda, shoulda advice that I occasionally get is someone telling me that I should have fired signal shots. And in that presentation I said it would take me 15 minutes to sufficiently explain why signal shots weren't an option, just suffice it to say that it wasn't. Well, unfortunately, that didn't suffice. I got all kinds of commentary from people accusing me of this or that. And there was a few, just a few people who wrote what I would consider to be some very strange things. And I won't get the quote exactly right, but it was something that, based on their lack of understanding of what I was doing, lack of understanding of my motivations, lack of understanding of the circumstances, and complete ignorance of what was going on, they were forced to conclude that I must have been up to something nefarious. What can I even say about that, except that I hope that the people who wrote that don't have children. I hope they don't have driver's licenses. I certainly hope that they don't hold any supervisory billet at their job, and I hope they've never sat on a jury. That kind of ignorance and bigotry makes you a danger to everyone around you. There are certain anecdotes that I don't tell. The police represent themselves as highly trained professionals, and the great majority of them are. But this is not the format to complain about the ignorance and malfeasance of that minority of them that aren't highly trained professionals.